Our country is going through some difficult, some crazy times right now, and uh, it's really brought on by highlighting really the, the social injustices that have existed historically in our nation, which have reached a crescendo within the last few years and uh, really have hit a boiling point to some degree within the last couple months or so. Uh, You see, last week was the first part of a look at racial relations from a biblical perspective. Uh, A few years ago, I heard a fantastic sermon by uh, a, a guy named Tony Evans on this topic. He's a preacher at the Bible Fellowship Church in Dallas, Texas, and his thoughts were, for the most part, uh, spot on and relevant. And, and I felt that they were highly appropriate for the church where I was preaching in St. Louis, and I knew that I wanted to also convey these thoughts here as well in Salem. I just didn't know that Uh, when I would get around to preaching these sermons, that I would do so. It's such a tense moment in our nation's history. So last week and today, uh, we have and we will continue to look at the idea of differences in race, culture, and class from the Bible. Uh, Finishing our look at at how Jesus, uh, how he interacted with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, but really branching out some more as well as we look at a topic that seems to be building to some kind of a boiling point in our society today. Good morning. Uh, It is indeed a great opportunity here for us to be together. And, And I hope that you can appreciate that even though we are separated by distance this morning, Here we are together in the spirit, worshiping our God. Um, I know that this is a a tough topic for us to really discuss, but it's one that needs to be discussed, especially when we have such a great example of Jesus himself in John chapter 4, as he takes us through exactly how it is that we can overcome all of the racial societal class differences that we find. And so as we look at John chapter 4 and and we talk about uh, Jesus and this Samaritan woman, it's important that we remember what's going on in John chapter 4. Remember this is all set up when it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He didn't have to go through Samaria. In fact, uh, the Jews rarely went through Samaria. They usually would take a circuitous route around Samaria in order to go from Jerusalem to Galilee. But Jesus said that he had to because he had something very particular in mind. Uh, The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. John makes that clear in John chapter 4. And and to be kind of a half-breed, dogs of a sort, Because of all the events that surrounded the destruction of the nation of Israel, the northern nation, and afterwards, uh, the Samaritans are kind of the final product of those of Israel who were left in the land uh, and then those who were brought into the land and the intermixing of those peoples. Um, And so eventually they became the Samaritans and the Samaritans and the Jews, they did not get along at all. And so Jesus comes onto the scene, and he comes and he talks to a Samaritan woman. And he says to this Samaritan woman, Can I have a drink from your cup? Now, that did not at all fit into the mold that uh, would have been expected by this woman. Uh, Remember... Uh, When we simplify our definitions here, sociology is the focus on the society around you. Theology is the focus that you have on God. Uh, And Jesus is going to do something incredible with this woman, but he didn't just come in with a bunch of theology. He came in and he broke the barriers that were created by their sociology first. A Jew does not put his lips on a Samaritan's cup especially if it's a Samaritan woman. But Jesus did. And because he was willing to drink from her cup, that opened up all kinds of paths for his theology. 
You see, this woman was just uh, clearly as anti-Jew as she assumed that the Jews were anti-Samaritan. Multiple times she makes what could be viewed as racist comments, especially when she talks about you as in you people in verse 20. Uh, and she talks about their differences in worship, their irreconcilable differences in culture and everything involved. And Jesus corrects her when she starts talking about where they worship and starts saying, well, we just worship over here at Gerizim and y'all just worship down there in Jerusalem. We just do things differently. Jesus corrects her telling her the Jews worship in Jerusalem because, well, that's where they were supposed to worship in Jerusalem. Uh, they were doing what was right. However, he was willing to allow this racial divide to occur in the beginning, but when it manifested itself in incorrect worship, he had to step in and explain things a little more clearly. And this pretty much catches us up with where we were in the discussion last week and so we are going to move on from that place in the text. And so if you open up to John chapter 4, in John chapter 4, um, we'll go ahead and just back up um, just a little bit here. Um, where, let's see, let's start in verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship what we know because salvation is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back and marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look. I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you've entered into their labor. And many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. And so we see now, Jesus has come to Samaria, uh, and he's come, he's talked to this woman, and as the story goes on, what we find out is indeed, they had a singular hope together, that is the Jews and the Samaritans, they all believed in the coming Messiah. They knew that the Messiah would come. And so this woman says, hey, I know the Messiah is going to come. And she knows that when the Messiah comes, the Messiah is going to bring all the answers. You see, she may not have been fully accepting of Jesus' answers up to this point. It wasn't what she wanted to hear necessarily. Nobody wants to hear that their family and all their traditions and everything that they've been doing is wrong. But Jesus told her that uh, they were not in line with the word of God. 
Because the word of God had said y'all are supposed to worship in Jerusalem, not at Gerizim. Well, now she puts her hope where undoubtedly they had all put their hope in the coming Messiah. Doesn't this sound great? Doesn't this sound spiritual? When the Messiah comes, then we'll know everything. When Jesus comes, everything's going to get better. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. But Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Understand, she has a hope in what is to come. She has a hope in the Messiah who, who's on his way. And Jesus says, hey, I'm already here. Lady, I have been here already. You're waiting for something that you don't have to wait for anymore. I, you know, she wants the answers. But there are some answers that aren't a long ways off. Now, sure, there are some things that we just will not know and we're not going to understand until that day uh, when Jesus returns. But there are a lot of things that Jesus has already revealed for us and who and what he is and has given to us through all of these scriptures, particularly all that stuff recorded in the Gospels and throughout the New Testament. We don't have to wonder about some things. Jesus, the answer, has already come and he's already provided those answers for us. If we just simply be humble enough to look for those answers and then to live by those answers. Now, if you will recall from last week, uh, Jesus was all alone at the well because his disciples had already gone into town to buy some food. Have you ever wondered about that? Uh, why they leave him all by himself, why he sends them away. Why did they have to do that? Don't you think maybe one or two could have stayed back and kept him company? I mean, especially if he was getting thirsty, one of them could have got water, right? Well, I'm pretty confident he probably didn't allow them. You see, when they came back from getting the food, they saw Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman and they were shocked to find that he was doing so. Now, I don't think it was the idea that he was simply talking to a woman because Jesus has talked to women before. There's something different about this scenario from the other scenarios before. What they don't expect is the same thing that she didn't expect when Jesus came up to her. It's that a Jewish man is talking to a Samaritan woman. I mean, what would these disciples have thought if they'd seen him actually take a drink from her cup? How often do they wrongly speak up anyway, all the way through the Gospels, and say all kinds of things that perhaps they shouldn't have said? Don't you think they would have probably said a few things that might not have been good right here in this instance? And therein, we probably see why it is they all had to go get food, why none of them stayed behind, is because Jesus knew in this point period of time he was going to talk to this woman and it would have been a lot more difficult with a bunch of racists standing there with him. But notice that he doesn't let them stop him from doing what he knows he's supposed to do. Folks, just because all your friends or family or your group doesn't do what's right, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you should follow them. Jesus said, y'all go on, I'll catch up with you later. You know, this isn't the last time that we're going to find Peter perhaps on the wrong side of this issue as he looks and wonders about Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman because if you will recall, and we're not going to take the time to, to read through this, but if you will recall, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks about an episode involving Peter and race. You see, in Galatians 2, Paul recounts a story where Peter has come down to Antioch, and we don't exactly know why. I have my theory as to what it is, but we, just, we don't know why he's there. But Peter comes to Antioch, which if you will recall, 
Antioch was the very first predominantly Gentile church. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because remember, Peter was the first one who preached the gospel to a Gentile. Remember when he went to Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10? Peter's the one who first spoke the gospel message to Gentiles, and he was the first to baptize Gentiles. And it would make sense that Peter would be just fine with the Gentiles. Uh, and also, you know, some of the Jews, of course, including Paul and Barnabas, who were there at Antioch during this time, they all were getting along with the Gentiles. No problems at all. But Paul recounts that time when some Jews from Jerusalem, it says some men from James, came to Antioch to check on Peter. And that's the point. That's the, 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 the text that tells us that even though Peter had no problems uh, communing and eating and dining with the Gentiles, when the men from James came down, he stopped doing it. You know, it's almost like that scene in the cafeteria, uh, you know, where the cool kids come in and sit down, but the leader of the cool kids, who secretly has also kind of been hanging out with some of the geeks, well, he realizes that the rest of the cool kids are there, so he gets up, he leaves the geeks behind, and he goes and sits down with them. Yeah, how does that happen? You can almost see the thoughts of the Jews here. You know, we're going to live with them in heaven, that's fine, but that doesn't mean we have to hang out with them here on earth, does it? <laughs> it's as if they said, you know, this is unacceptable for you to be with those people. And notice the language, if you're there uh, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11, it says that Peter feared the party of the circumcision. He feared those Jews who came down. They intimidated Peter so much that he got up from the chair and he left the Gentile table. And folks, Peter wasn't the only one. The rest of the Jews, seeing Peter doing this, they got up and they also went with Peter because they didn't want to offend their own race. It says even Barnabas was carried away by this hypocrisy. Now notice, uh, Peter really is, to some degree, the leader here. And at least, you know, uh, from those Jerus from Jerusalem uh, and all of the Jews who'd come down, but when Peter gets up, the rest of them are going to follow as well. They're going to follow his leadership because that's the place that he has as a leader when he leads people follow. Now, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt when I can. And I think I can give Peter the benefit of the doubt here. I don't think Peter believed at all in any kind of racial segregation. I mean, remember, he'd been eating with the Gentiles up to this point. He didn't have a problem at all with it. But I think what genuinely scared him was that by so blatantly eating with the Gentiles in front of the Jews from Jerusalem, who were not used to it, he was scared that he would end up rocking a boat and uh, it would put in their minds, you know, some kind of issues and it would create a fight that Peter says is just not worth fighting. But even with good intentions, that doesn't make a wrong decision right. And they certainly don't carry over to everyone else. Uh, keep in mind, as the statement goes, I'm sure you've heard this before, a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew. In other words, the leadership of a church are, are under a much higher level of scrutiny because their teachings and their statements and their actions are being seen and they're being followed by people who don't know any better. As Tony Evans uh, stated, if our pulpits were right, we would have solved this problem of racism a long time ago. Let me say that again. If our pulpits were right, historically speaking, we would have solved this problem of racism a long time ago. But on this issue, historically, the pulpits in Christendom at large have been anemic. And they've allowed chaos on this issue because the pulpits have been silent on the issue, maintaining a manifest destiny ideology that was in contrast to biblical theology.
And nothing in this story shows just how easy it is for a mob mentality to take over when it comes to these kinds of issues than the fact that even Barnabas was carried away with this too. If you recall, we talked about Barnabas just a couple weeks ago, didn't we? And I'm sure many of you remember our discussion about Barnabas, a man whose name means the son of encouragement. He's that guy who's always there to lift other people up. He's always there to encourage those who've been abandoned by others, those who've been marginalized and put on the sides. Remember, when Paul wasn't accepted in Jerusalem, it was Barnabas who stood up for him. Remember when Paul rejected John Mark for the second journey, it was Barnabas who stood up for him. And Barnabas was there in Antioch before Paul was. He had more to do with the church in Antioch. And perhaps some of you might even remember Barnabas was from Cyprus. He was born, presumably grew up among Gentiles. He knew what it was like to be in these types of situations with Jews and Gentiles together. He had connections with Gentiles that many other people probably didn't have. Even Barnabas is carried away by this racial hypocrisy, and that's how bad racism is. It can make a good man bad. When everyone else was abandoning these Gentiles, we'd have thought at least Barnabas, who has a history of being the one who stands up for the rejected, at least he would have stood up for these Gentiles, right? Nope. In order to make sure he wasn't offending, his own race. He disobeyed God, even Barnabas. And who knows what might have happened moving forward if Paul had not been there. Now, we don't have the time again to uh, break down everything that's going on, uh, but this whole section, as Paul responds to Peter and this hypocrisy in Galatians 2, uh, it is full of just all kinds of, of very, um, it, it's heavy in the Judaizing teaching debate of the first century, um, you know, and how it is that uh, the Jews believe the Gentiles had to be Jews in order to become Christians. But the gist of it is, you know, he says there's nothing special about the Jewish people just because they have the law of Moses. And when the works of the law of Moses are placed on a higher place, uh, when it comes to being right before God, there are going to be problems. And that is exactly what these people were doing. Paul called them hypocrites, which, by the way, that's not a good thing. Uh, it's usually bad and sinful. And he did so right then and right there. He wanted everyone to know and to see the truth, because if they did not, this situation could have had very serious ramifications moving forward. He said that they embarrassed the truth of the gospel. Uh, you know, he, he said that, that they were making Jesus Christ himself look bad. Folks, <laughs> this is not just a social decision that was made by Paul. He looks at these hypocrites and he says, y'all are embarrassing the good news of the cross. Why? Because folks, the cross doesn't divide. The cross brings people together. It brings people together across racial and cultural lines. And at the cross, the only qualification that you need is that you are a sinner in need of a savior, regardless of your class, your culture, or your race. And Paul tells them, you have messed up that message. And I'm sure that you have heard uh, verse 20 before in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Well, what you might not be familiar with is the fact that this verse is part of Paul's rebuke to Peter. He's rebuking Peter here in Galatians chapter 2 saying, you've got the wrong identity. 
Your identity first is not in your culture, your class, your race, your background, your history. Your identity first is in your Christ. You have Christ living within you. It is no longer you who live. And it is all about your Christian commitment. Because Peter, truth overrides tradition. Truth overrides color. There must be a single standard by which you are able to judge your race. The standard of the cross as it is found within the Holy Scriptures. And as long as everything stays under that standard, then we have a right to be as different as we want to be. As long as we're living differently within the confines of what's here. You know, God does not ask me to appreciate rap music or even necessarily R&B. And, and I'm talking about the wholesome stuff, not the uh, stuff that's out there that probably nobody should be uh, filling their minds with. But at the same time, not everybody has to be uh, big fans of Weird Al Yankovic. Although, if I find out you dislike him, I might question your judgment. Um, you know, we can all have differences as much as we want, as long as it does not conflict with the authority of God, the rule of God, and the person of Jesus Christ and your Christian commitment. We must be Christians first. And if we can get enough Christians to be Christians before white, or Christians before black, or Christians before Hispanic, it's not going to take 240 years to fix this problem. Maybe closer to two hours and 40 minutes. You see, when you come back to John chapter 4, what we find is that the woman ran back into town. You see that in verse 29, she said, y'all got to come and see this man who told me all the things that I've done. And what's the result of that? She goes to the city, she goes to the men, and the men of the city decide that they're going to come out to Jesus to talk to him because of the cross-cultural racial witness to this Samaritan woman. And then when she leaves, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, hey, Rabbi, eat. They want to give him food, but he rejects this food. Now, keep in mind, they went into town and uh, it was a few miles each way. It's not like, you know, they hopped in a car, turned on the AC and went through a McDonald's drive through or anything like that. Uh, this was a trip for them to go from the well, go and find the food and then bring it back. And Jesus says, I don't need your food. I've got food for myself. Say, what? <laughs> they went through that entire trip to get food, and someone had already come and given them food. I mean, you can bet they were throwing some accusations around in verse 33 when they're questioning, who is it that gave them food? And then you see in verse 34, Jesus responds, and he says to them, uh, what satisfies him is doing the will of his Father. You know, I wish uh, the text told us a little bit more information. I wish I knew what these uh, disciples were saying about eating Samaritan food, if perhaps they were complaining about it having come from the Samaritans. You know, but Jesus is setting them up with his statements here. And he's making it very clear that he is about doing the will of God, regardless of what their thoughts on the matter might be. And you see in, in verse 35, Jesus tells them, don't worry. Don't say four months and then comes the harvest. He says, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are right now, white for harvest. What's the point of that? The point is <laughs> that there is a tendency to say, we just planted and there's a whole lot of time until the harvest comes. But time has a way of catching up with you sometimes, doesn't it? Especially if you're not that sure about the growth of the plant and how fast these seeds are going to work. And this goes back to the woman's statement about the Messiah coming, doesn't it? He says there will be a time, a future time, it's coming, when all the wrongs are going to be righted, everything's going to be great, we're going to know all things. 
We, we have four entire months before the harvest is going to happen. And Jesus tells them, there are some harvests that you don't put off. There are some things that happen immediately where the sower and the reaper get to celebrate together at the same time. When they turned around and looked, as Jesus said, look at the fields. They're white for harvest. What do you think those disciples saw? I bet you this is what they saw. I bet when they looked out, they saw a bunch of Samaritan men who were crossing those very fields to come to Jesus, to talk with Jesus, to have a discussion about Jesus as the Messiah. Folks, what has Jesus done? He has set up the opportunity for these disciples to relate to people of a different race. He has set up this scenario. And this is a scenario that always must be set up by the body of Christ, which is supposed to reflect Christ, where anybody can come through these doors in a metaphorical way. Obviously, we're not in those doors right now, but we know that we as a church, we as a group, must be welcome to everybody who respect our faith in Jesus Christ, and regardless of history or background or race or culture, they are welcome in the family of God fully and completely because we have a standard and our standard is Jesus not what we want not what we hope not what we think it's all about what's here and I love how this story concludes when you go to verses 39 and 40 it says from that city many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified he told me all the things I have done so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Now, consider this for just a moment. When we started out looking at this last week, remember the woman was shocked that here this Jewish man was asking for a drink from her cup. The fact that he was spending even just a couple minutes talking to her was astounding. Now he's hanging out with them for the weekend. He stays with them for two days. How do you go from people not even drinking out of the same cup to just a couple hours later being asked to stay for the whole weekend? Folks, when you do things God's way, it doesn't take that long. The racial, the cultural, the class barriers are all going to deteriorate right before our eyes. And they will be replaced with the cross of Jesus Christ. But it starts from being willing to drink from that cup. Now I tell you what, this is all fine and dandy for us, isn't it? This all sounds great to talk about here in our collective group. You know, there's uh, some comfort in these proverbial walls that we're in right here. Uh, we can stand strong when we're here, when we're together. But what happens when we have to go out and we have to be confronted away from the security of the rest of the group? What happens when you go out and you have to face your own race? What happens when your biblical view is not the popular view? What happens when you are rejected because you are, uh, you're being told that you're not white enough or you're not black enough or red enough or yellow enough? What happens when, when you have to take that stand responsibly, kindly, lovingly, but you clearly have to take that stand? Because when people hear the message and love and unity and such, yeah, that's all fine and dandy and good right here, but what happens when we're, about, we're around a bunch of racist friends or coworkers or just people we run into who assume that we're going to be with them because of the color of our skin, and then we begin to show what the love of Christ looks like? What happens when we're called traitors or hypocrites? or we're just simply ostracized because we demonstrate what the love of Christ looks like? What happens when it becomes easier to blend in with the crowd that we're around than it does to stand out 
by putting aside racial differences and showing the love of Jesus to another. Are we ready? You see, what God is looking for are some serious Christians on this issue. He's looking for those who are going to start biblically and spiritually and then go down from there. They, you know, then they worry about all of this that's going around racially, socially, culturally. Only after first and foremost we have looked biblically and spiritually. We do not start with our culture and then work up to a biblical understanding. We start with the word and the authority of our faith and then we work in the rest. May God help us to do our part, locally, personally, in our families, and through our influence to bring people to a spiritual, biblical approach to the issue of race, culture, in class. Then at last, we can model before the world biblical solutions to a society that's in chaos. Would you pray with me? Our great and almighty sovereign God, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. Uh, help us to live these truths that we see within your word in our own lives. When we uh, go out into the world, give us the courage and, and the boldness uh, to go against whatever our culture and society tells us to do, which is against your word. We thank you for Jesus who created the path in every way for us to follow. We thank you for his example. We thank you for his life and for his death and for his resurrection, which gives us the hope to cling to in these times of chaos. We thank you for your love, and it's in Jesus' name we now pray. Amen. <clears throat> you know, in the midst of this, I referenced Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Here Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You know, this is the hope that we have. We crucify ourselves. We die to Christ. And what we gain is so much better. If you have not done this, and this is something that you want to know more about, please contact us at the Market Street Church of Christ in Salem, Oregon, and we would love to take the opportunity to help you know more about your God and the hope that you can have through your Savior.